Hi, I'm Kasper, and I'll be presenting three attacks on proof of stake Ethereum, which has been joint work together with Joachim Nusret and David from Stanford University, as well as my colleagues Barnaby and Aditya from the Ethereum Foundation. Now, most of the paper revolves around the Yorks. So to set the stage, let me start by providing a high-level distinction between different kinds of reorgs, after which I'll be talking about why reorgs matter and then get into the specifics of the attacks. So um, on the one hand, we have ex post reorgs, and on the other hand, ex ante reorgs. Um, with ex post reorgs are kind of what we usually think of. You want to reorg a block, and so you build on a parent. And if reorgs, if the reorg is successful, the next block builds on your block. With ex ante reorgs, it's different. When you start the attack, you actually don't know which block you will end up um, reorging out. And so this kind of a reorg is achievable by strategically timing uh, the release of your messages. But we'll look at the specifics shortly. Um, so in short, ex post reorgs are reactive. I see a block and decide to fork it out. And ex ante reorgs are proactive. I have an opportunity. So let me set the system up for failure later. Now, why do reorgs actually matter? Um, a safe, safe and live protocol can actually exhibit reorgs. So can't really be that bad if it's safe and live, right? So essentially, that leads kind of to the classical security notion, not um, preventing them, because, well, they're still safe and live, the protocols. Um, and why is that bad? Well, essentially, at its core, we all kick honest blocks out, um, out of the permanent chain, that is. And that is bad because it's a reduction in the chain quality of service. Um, what do I mean by that? Well. Kicking honest blocks out of the chain has a consequence on both latency between blocks that end up on the permanent on the permanent chain, as well as the capacity, as in how many blocks in a given time frame time frame end up in the permanent chain. So maybe we should introduce a notion of chain quality of service and aim for some max maximum amount of latency between these permanent blocks, as well as some minimum capacity. Um, why care about latency? Well, latency leads to uncertainty around the confirmation uh, of a transaction as well as the context of a transaction. Um, so for example, a trader could have worse than expected trade execution due to, um, due to the new order of transaction as caused by a reorg. Um, and why care about capacity? Well, less blocks in the permanent chain obviously lead to less transaction throughput, which in turn leads to higher transaction fees, which obviously is a bad thing for users. Um, but even more detrimental is if consensus messages have to actually go on chain, then well, they have to fit at least some of them to even have a live protocol. Uh, in the Ethereum case, that is at least two thirds of all votes must fit. And so one way actually to think about reorgs is by framing it as, a, as an attack on the quality of liveness. And maybe as a consequence, we should kind of consider a stronger notion of liveness using something like chain quality of service. Now, all of this gets really interesting once we start considering something called maximal extractable value or in short MEV. Um, what is it? Um, MEV captures the block proposal's opportunity to extract value by strategically including and ordering transactions in a given block. Now, let's unpack that. Um, typical MEV opportunities are arbitraging a trade, front running it, sandwiching it, and whatnot. Um, now, natural question is why does the MEV opportunity end up with the proposal? Um, well, the thing is that if I see um, if I see an arbitrage opportunity, someone else likely sees it too, right? So essentially, we're willing to pay the proposer to include our transaction before the others up until close to the entire MEV opportunity, and that is because the order matters, right? If the other, if my competitor's transaction is included before mine, 
well, then I'm not going to be able to capture the arbitrage opportunity anymore because it's gone by the time my transaction is considered. So most of the MEV opportunity ends up being captured by, by the miner or proposer, depending on whether we are in the proof of work or proof of stake world. Um, and reorgs essentially allow you to steal MEV. So in the ex post setting, if I see a block that is um, capable of capturing a lot of MEV, I might try to reorg it to capture these opportunities for myself. So a lot of MEV in a block increases the incentives to reorg it. And to give you a sense of the magnitude of MEV, um, consider that over the last two years, more than or roughly around 600 million US dollars worth of MEV uh, has been have been extracted and that is only the lower lower bound so and on top of that most of it happened in the last year so the trend is really getting started only um, so the reorgability of a chain together with mev can create incentives that make honest but rational actors deviate from the honest protocol and by doing so, undermining the security of consensus itself. Now, again, just to emphasize this, reorging together with MEV, which basically just introduces strong incentives to reorg, can actually lead to um, non-honest behavior, undermining the security of consensus itself. Um, at this point, I'd like to mention some of the related work. So. There's Lion Cats who talk about whale transactions, which are transactions paying lots of fees. Um, miners reorg blocks and then leave some of the transaction fee to next to the next miner to incentivize miners to use their block instead of reorging it again. Essentially, it's it's bribing um, bribing miners to to build on top of their block as opposed to getting reorged again. Now Carlson and others then. Um, take it to um, into the context of Bitcoin without block rewards. And they show how an initially innocent looking strategy can lead to strategies that end up intentionally forking the chain. Um, and this was all somewhat considered to be a distant problem of a no block reward future, because obviously Bitcoin right now still has block rewards. Um, and then uh, comes Philip, uh, Phil Dyan and others that introduce MEV in their paper Flash Boys 2.0, um, where they also talk about what they call a time bandit attack, which basically show that, shows that high MEV regimes in general can basically lead to miners um, wanting to reorg the chain due to um, the MEV incentives. And so basically, um, the argument is that even though we still have we still have block rewards, MEV can can have such strong incentives that make people deviate from the honest protocol um, already. Um, and in the proof of stake Ethereum setting, um, the ability to do reorgs and what kind of reorgs dramatically changes. Um, this is also then where ex ante reorgs enter the picture. And um, these ex ante reorgs are very similar in spirit to selfish mining as introduced by Eyal and Sira. Um, they use similar strategic timing techniques um, that we will get to in, the, in a moment. Um, let me note, though, however, that in ex ante reorgs, um, ex ante reorgs are in itself not a profitable strategy in proof of stake Ethereum, whereas um, selfish mining is a profitable strategy in itself. Um, but again, MEV changes the landscape in that respect. Now, let me summarize why reorgs matter. Um, on the one hand, reorgs attack components that are dependent on consensus. So the quality of service of the chain um, and latency and capacity in particular that we talked about. And then on the other hand, we have Reorgs also attacking the security of consensus itself, which is where it, get, where it gets really fundamental, um, which is um, the reorgability together with MEV that um, creates these incentives to, to actually deviate from the honest protocol. Um, but note that 
both uh, both these kind of uh, framings have potential downstream uh, effects on the security of the overall system. Um, so, as I as I mentioned earlier, capacity, for example, a lack of capacity can lead to liveness breaking. Um, now that I've kind of motivated reorgs, let me um, continue on to um, walk through some of the specifics of how reorgs work. Um, and let's start by comparing ex post reorgs in the proof of work versus proof of stake setting. In the proof of work world, well, reorgs are very hard, but they're also not unfeasible. Um, a large miner could, for example, has like a decent chance of mining several blocks in a row. And so if the incentive is strong enough, I think a 100 ETH MEV blocks, these actually exist. Um, a 1% success rate may actually be sufficient um, to make me try to reorg this block. Um, and in the ex post, uh, in the proof of stake um, Ethereum setting, this um, dramatically changes the feasibility of reorgs. Um, to, to walk through the specifics of how to do that in the proof of stake setting, I'll need to introduce some basics. Um, time in proof of stake Ethereum progresses in slots. Each there is a slot every twelve seconds, and there are two roles per slot: a single block proposer and a committee of attesters voting for the head of the chain. And this committee is thousands of attesters each single round. So right now, using the current numbers of the Beacon Chain, um, Ethereum has around ten thousand uh, attesters voting every single slot. That is a dramatic difference to proof of work, where one minor equals one vote. And here we have 10,000s of votes um, that are being accumulated in parallel voting for the head of the chain. Um, and these attesters run a fork choice rule to determine the head of the chain. And then uh, after, after they run the fork choice, they vote for it, for, for the block. And, um, an attester is supposed to vote when a valid block is heard or four seconds into the slot. So whatever happens first, um, then you vote. Um, and voting increases um, the weight of a block. And this notion of weight is um, what is used by the fork choice to determine the head of the chain. So essentially, the fork choice walks down the block tree. And whenever a block has multiple children, it selects the child with most weight. Um, or said differently, it selects the, the heaviest subtree. Um, this is, this is um, the following the ghost protocol as proposed by, put forward by Sopolinsky and Zoha. Um, and now that we've kind of established some basics, let's actually walk through a ex post reorg and proof of stake. Um, so let's assume that n plus one is very profitable um, so that the block proposer in n plus two wants to reorg it out. And the point of this slide is actually to demonstrate how exceptionally difficult it is to do ex post reorgs in proof of stake Ethereum. Um, now, let's, this is our setting. And so what happens in block n plus one? In block n plus one, the adversary is going to vote um, for block n. Why? Well, it doesn't want to give block n plus one weight because that's the block the adversary is trying to reorg. Um, the honest committee members, however, will, will vote for block n plus one. Why? Well, it's a, it's a valid block, so you vote for it. Um, now, n plus two, uh, as I said, builds on the same parent, be block being block n, and the adversary will obviously vote for that block because it's the block that they want to establish on the permanent chain. Um, whereas the honest proposers, uh, not proposers, the honest committee members, they will vote again for block n plus one. Why is that? Well, the fork choice rule only considers attestations from previous slots. So they don't consider the two thirds of attestations that they may have heard voting for block n plus two. Um, so when they see they currently see block n plus one with one third weight and block n plus two with two uh, with no weight because they don't consider the two thirds. Um, 
Now, obviously, then block N plus one uh, is the heavier subtree, so they vote for that. Now, at the end of this, uh, we have block N plus one with two thirds of weight and N plus two with two thirds of weight. And if we assume that the tie breaks in favor of the adversary, well, then we have block N plus three building on top of X block N plus two, and the X post reorg is complete. Now, one thing you might wonder is, is it possible for an adversary that doesn't control two thirds um, of total stake in Ethereum um, to accidentally control two thirds in a given committee? Um, and actually, no, it turns out not. Um, so using current committee size numbers, which is roughly 10,000, a 65% staker controlling two thirds of a committee in any given slot has probability of around 0.001%. So, and if you go to 64%, that's already virtually zero. Um, and this is to say that even for an attacker controlling 65% of total stake, they will struggle to get the control of two thirds of all validators in a committee in a given slot. In summary, this break, like you can break, um, break it down to the power of parallel attestations. Parallel attestations make ex post reorg seemingly unfeasible. Um, again, in proof of work, a miner is basically one vote. Pro when they mine a block and propose it, then they vote for whatever they consider the head of the chain. But here you have 10,000 um, committee members voting in parallel. So as an attacker, you not only have to fight the block proposal, but 10,000 um, committee members. Now, let's finally get to ex ante reorgs. Um, let's remind ourselves um, we, we have a block uh, slot where we, we have a slot where we get to propose a block and we want to reorg a future block out. How do we do it? Um, oh, actually, forgive me. Um, this is this ex ante reorg is um, an improvement to the attack, to an attack proposed by Neuder and others in their paper, Low Cost attacks on Ethereum 2.0. Uh, and the key idea is basically avoiding this, uh, what I just called power of parallel attestations by essentially splitting honest validators into different views. And this is exactly what's possible in the ex ante reorg set. So let's actually run through the specifics now. Um, block N is honest. Honest, everyone just attests to it, business as usual. Now in comes block N plus one. Um, by the adversary that keeps this block private for now, as well as this private attestation, uh, as well as this N plus attestation from slot N plus one. Now, the honest committee members will not see block N plus one. They're not aware of its existence. So they end up voting for block N. Um, and similarly, the block proposal of N plus two is not aware of the existence of block N plus one. Um, now, Let's assume zero network latency for now. Um, and why should the propose the committee members of slot N plus two vote for black N plus one? Well, if the adversary releases its N plus one block and the private attestation at the same time as block N plus two, remember we're assuming zero network latency, then what the committee members in slot n plus two will see is a block n plus two and block n plus one with this uh, single attestation. Now the fork choice will actually establish that n plus one is the heavier subtree because essentially all the honest attestations from slot n as well as n plus one are voting for n, which is weight that is inherited by block n plus one as well as n plus two, but only block n plus one uh, has this one single additional vote. So it has one more weight. And so the fork choice um, will determine block N plus one as the head of the chain. And so eventually block N plus three um, votes, uh, builds on top of block N plus one and the X ante reorg is complete. Um, will it relax the network latency assumption in a bit? Um, but let me first introduce you uh, to the balancing attack which in itself is an attack to store liveness, but also introduces balancing techniques that we will use to further improve the ex ante reorg. 
And the very high level idea behind the attack is to split nodes into di different views with the goal to make them vote for different blocks, essentially. Um, now, this, is, this attack is a variant of my co-authors from this paper, Joachim, Nusret, and David, in their paper, Ebb and Flow Protocol. Um, and how do, we, how do we go about it? So first, um, the adversary kind of waits for an opportune epoch to launch the attack. And let's say the epoch is opportune if the block proposes in slot zero and one are adversary. Um, and let's call them, so then the adversary privately proposes new blocks uh, in slot zero and one. Let's call them the left chain and the right chain. And the adversary only releases these chains after slot one. And let's assume that the tie break favors the left chain. So um, what would happen if everything stopped right here? So we currently have the left chain and the right chain. Um, and we're assuming that the tie break uh, favors the left chain. Now, essentially, if nothing further is done by the adversary, what will happen is that all the honest committee members simply vote for the left chain, and that's going to be the permanent chain, and that's the end of it. Um, obviously, the adversary doesn't stop here. So um, let's remind ourselves of what we're trying to achieve here. We want to make half the, of the honest validators think that the left chain is the head of the chain, and the other half that the right chain is the head of the chain. How do we do it? We do it by releasing a so-called sway vote for the right chain. Um, and we try to time this so that half of the honest committee members see the sway vote before they attest and the other half after they attest. And if the timing is tuned well to the network propagation um, of the network propagation behavior at large, um, then roughly one half of honest committee's members honest committee members of slot two see the sway vote before they cast their vote and thus view the right chain. Remember that we're voting for the right chain. Um, and the other half sees the sway vote only after they've voted already. Um, and so they view the left chain as leading. Remember, we're assuming that the tie break favors left. Um, and so, Next, the adversary can kind of observe the outcome of the vote, which will likely never be exactly 50 50, um, but it will only be a gap up to the order of the square root of the honest committee size, which is, is, is just the variant of a binomial distribution. And basically, the adversary observes this gap and then can use its committee members from previous slots, so slot zero, one, or two to rebalance the vote to a 50-50 tie exactly. And as the tie is restored, the adversary can essentially just keep going using the same strategy at infinitum. And um, the um, adversary to kind of continue this attack in perpetuity needs to control stake in the order of one over the square root of the honest committee size. And in which case, if that is actually what's happening, then we actually have uh, liveness being stalled um, because no chain would manage to accumulate the necessary two thirds majority um, to make progress. Um, and here on this graph we diagram, we see um, the degree of control that is possible through timed release uh, through the time release of messages, even though we're assuming no adversarial network control. Um, essentially, we have a network in which we simulate message broadcasting. Um, and here on the X axis, we have time and on the Y axis, the share of nodes that have received messages. Um, and as we can see, the results are fairly concentrated around the mean. Um, and this suggests we have a fair amount of precision to time messages and split the network into 50-50 split. Um, feel free to check out the code as well. Mm. Now, yet let's use some of these balancing techniques to uh, improve the ex-ante um, reorg. 
And essentially, we use balancing techniques to keep honest committee members split roughly in half by ensuring they have um, different views. And so they vote um, uh, differently on what the current head of the chain is. And essentially, what we achieve by doing so is that the honest committee cancels each other out in terms of fog choice uh, weight. And then the adversary can just swoop in with uh, a couple of attestations. Um, attestations being votes for the head of the chain and tip the chain to their liking in one or the other direction. Um, so how do we do it? Well, block N um, as normal, and then comes N, N plus one again, we keep it private. And where it's different is that this time around in slot N plus two, we not only strategically wait for the honest proposer to release their block, but we also time our release of the private block as well as the attestation, such that roughly half of the honest committee members hear this way vote before they attest, and so vote for the adversary block, and the other half after they test, and so vote for on for the honest block. Um, and actually, we're gonna keep this we are going for one more block just because we can. Um, and so we're actually aiming not for an exact 50-50 split, but but by a 50-50 split that is off by one favoring block n plus two, so that um, block n plus three is built on top of n plus two. Now, to conclude this two block reorg, um, the adversary now has to convince the majority of the n plus slot n plus three committee members to vote for block n plus one. So this time we're not concerned about the roughly half-half split, but we just want to make sure that the majority is um, voting for n plus one, and we do that by releasing the sway vote in, in such a way um, as described earlier. And um, if that is successful, well, block n plus four ends up voting for n plus one. Now, um, there was a handful, and you might be wondering why even do x onto reox? What's the point, right? I can't steal MEV as I can in x post reox. Um, sort of right, but not really, because again, MEV has uh, strong um, incentives at play here. Um, and essentially, you can still steal MEV, although in a different way. Um, and the way to think about it is that uh, rather than um, stealing old MEV, you can steal the block content of the block that you end up reorging out. Because in proof of stake, you don't have to commit to a block you can very quickly just copy paste the contents and then release that block, including your sway vote and convince the network to include it in their permanent chain. Um, an alternative way to think about ex ante reorgs is seeing them as buying time, meaning that the adversary gets to release their block um, basically in a one block reorg case 12 seconds later. So instead of having to release them immediately at slot at the beginning of slot n plus one, they get to release it around slot n plus two. And so they buy listening time to the mempool. And basically more transactions in the mempool imply more MEV because MEV opportunities grow um, with uh, more possible transaction order combinations. To wrap up this presentation, let me conclude by showing what, just walking through what we've discussed. So we've shown a way to store liveness using the balancing attack, and then went on to show how to reorganize the chain using ex ante reorgs. Um, and then we combined, combined ideas from both things to even improve the ex ante reorg further. Um, let me, uh, allow me to note here that as a response to the above attacks, basically, something called proposal weight boosting has been uh, put forward and even implemented and is live already. Um, as a fun fact, um, these ex ante reorgs were possible on the beacon chain, but because no um, transactions are associated um, with the beacon chain yet, um, there were no incentives to actually do these ex ante reorgs. But this will obviously change once the transition to proof of stake um, is completed. Um, however, the underlying principles of these attacks remain. So splitting all of the honest validators into different views using these timing um, and balancing techniques is very much still um, a thing that people should look at and consider for future research. Um, 
and hopefully um, I could motivate um, why reorgs matter. Um, in short, they attack the quality of liveness with potential downstream effects on the security of consensus itself. So we shouldn't treat them as a just a nuisance because the protocol is still in life, uh, safe in life. No, they actually matter for the security of consensus itself. Um, thank you for listening and goodbye.